Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Joe Foster. How are you, Joe? Uh, I'm great, thank you. First great, foremost, James. Thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. It founder really is. Of, you're founder of Reebok. Yeah. Well, we've heard more of you, I think, than you've heard of me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you're famous. You know. <laughs> One of the biggest sports brands on the planet. That phenomenal story from, is it Bolton? Bolton. Yeah, that's the origin of the Foster family business and Reebok. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great story, inspiration to many. Like, I know you're friends with Tommy Mallet, which we'll touch on later in the interview, who's <laughs> yes. a, another true inspiration from what he's trying to achieve and where he's trying to take his brand. Like, it's no mean feat to, to take something and take it to be at a global scale to do that. Like, it's extraordinary sacrifice, work ethic and belief, I believe, to take something to be <laughs> mega. You need a bit of luck, you know. and uh, you, 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 I, I think you need that sort of spirit. Well, this is what I'm doing. And I enjoy it. And if you do that, there's a good chance you'll you'll, you'll get there. And I know look, Tommy has that as well. And uh, um, different circumstances, you know. In my day, we didn't have computers, we didn't have smartphones or anything like that. It, it, we had to jump on an airplane, and you know, with a fistful of uh, American Express travelers checks, <clears throat> and go where it took you. Networking. Yes, networking. Yeah. I always go back to the start of my guest, Joe. Where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I grew up in Bolton. Um, I was born in 1935, four years before World War II. <laughs> so I'm only four when when sort of all the lights went out and, uh, you know, little education at that time, of course. You know, the people worry now about Brexit and uh, education being sort of uh, disrupted. Well, we had six years of disruption of education. So, um, but we got through, you know, was, that's what you do. How was it going through that era of World War? Look. I was a kid. What do you do as a kid? That's what, you know, this, isn't this how it always was? You know, it's, I mean, we're not always at war. I, I don't think you notice. When you're a kid, you uh, you grew up with what you grew up with and uh, you know, you're nothing to compare it with. Have you? <laughs> you're running through the streets, no lights on. Maybe that was a big advantage for us because <laughs> you know, we, could, we could enjoy it. Double summertime, so it was light till 11 o'clock at night. Not that we were out till 11 o'clock at night, I may add, but <laughs> yeah, so you grew up with it. What were you like at school? I was like at school. Um, I, I, I enjoyed school to a great extent, but like I was saying, the biggest problem was that uh, I was 10 when the war ended and really school didn't start until I was probably about nine or 10 when, you know, once war was sort of moving over to Europe. Um, so education came later. Um, and whilst I enjoyed it, yes, I enjoyed um, sciences, that sort of thing. I was not brilliant at uh, sort of literature or uh, English and stuff like that. That's something you, you pick up as you develop, as it were. And we had to pick it up late. So really, I suppose my education was secondary education. And uh, I did go to college until I was 17. Then I joined the family business. So, see, when it was a big sports brands or anything out back then? Was there any sort of sports brands back out in like the fifties? And well, I think you'd probably say Dunlop was probably a brand you consider a sports brand because they made um, plimsolls or gym shoes, that sort of stuff. And um, apart from that, no, I mean soccer boots. I don't know if you can. 
if you've ever seen the soccer boots of the, the 1940s, yeah. uh, I mean, the, the leather was that thick, ah. kip, you know, yeah. and they were so heavy. And they were, they were full of grease because that was to stop the water getting in. Um, so, And that was different from the Foster family made athletic shoes. And even though they supplied a lot of stuff to football clubs, in fact, 96 football clubs in the premiership, my grandfather supplied them with training shoes and boots. So, uh, but somewhere, somewhere around there, his sons just didn't continue that business. I don't know why. Um, because I suppose really our construction methods were much different from what we recognise, or what we used to recognise in those days as football boots with the strap across the instep and really heavy stuff. So the family tree goes, it goes way back as entrepreneurs as well. Was it 1985? Was it Jeff and Joe? Well, is that, is that your great grandparents? Uh, when, it, when it really goes back is to 1895. My grandfather. Yeah. My grandfather invented the spike running shoe. And uh, yeah, we talk about uh, influences today. But in 1904, my grandfather had given his shoes to a guy called Alf Shrub. And Alf Shrub, he broke four world records at Ibrox Park. In, Glasgow? Yeah, in Glasgow. Four, well, three world records in, in a one hour race. So, you know. From that day, and then in 1908, London Olympics, he got gold medals. And he, he, I mean, really, if he was in today's market, the guy would be the number one shoe brand, I'm quite sure. At uh, 1920s, that was his really belle epoque. Um, and we have a letterhead from, from the 1920s. And down each side, this is where the 96 football teams go. There's only one that I can't uh, see on, that's Tottenham Hotspur. But, you know... Glasgow, Celtic, all, you know, all the Scottish, all the English teams, Man United, Man City, Arsenal, Everton, you know, Chelsea, Chelsea, they were all on this list. And also at the bottom of the list was he supplied every athlete in the 1920s Olympic Games in Antwerp. I'm sure he was saying all the English rather, but just said all the athletes. <laughs> and in those days, you know, uh, the Olympics was just a track and field. Wasn't all what it is now. Yeah. It's massive now, but in those days, track and field. How was that then, being in that like, family organisation for like, the great grandparents who were succeeding, who were successful, to then taking a, a running shoot? Were they the first to ever have spikes on? Yeah. The trainers, like, where did they get that idea from? Well, he got his idea from his uh, his grandfather, would you believe? <laughs> um, he. His father was a confectioner, but he didn't want to be a confectioner. So he, he used to go to his grandfather's down in Nottingham, and his grandfather was a, a cobbler. He used to repair street shoes, but he also used to repair cricket boots. And cricket boots had spikes in the bottom. And uh, I'm pretty sure that my grandfather had said to him, why have they got spikes in the bottom of these, granddad? And <laughs> I'm sure the answer was, gives them grip. You know, when they're running about, they're bowling, they're fielding, they're batting, they need that grip. And... Uh, my grandfather was part of his local uh, athletics club, Bolton Primrose Areas. One of the good runner. He was about halfway down the field, but he enjoyed it. And uh, so I, he obviously thought, if I put some spikes in the bottom of my shoes, hmm, maybe it'll improve life. And he did. You know, from being halfway down the field, usually, he became a very unlikely second. And from that moment on, I'm not too sure that his fellow athletes were looking at him as like, you're a cheat, or... Maybe you should make those shoes for us. <laughs> yeah. And he did. And yeah. that was the beginning of his business. So he made shoes for all his local uh, friends, pals, athletes. And uh, yeah, they started to win a lot of uh, races at that point. <laughs> mm. So that's how it worked back then. Obviously, you've got your influence now on social media and posting a photo with a shoe, or wearing the track. So it's like back then, it was TV. Was there much TV coverage? But there wasn't. No, no TV. TV, TV yeah. was the name of the, the TV invented. 40s? Um, well, before TV got to sport, I would say it'd be after the world, after World yeah. War II, really, you know, late 40s, early 50s. So you're talking newspapers, magazines then to help magazines, promote the brands? Yeah, magazines and uh, just events. It's like, you know, you get a souvenir um, magazine. If you go to an event, well, he'd be advertising in the event magazine. Mm -hmm. um, he also used to advertise in the local sort of sports magazine, which I think was called, it was... I think it was the Sportsman, and I think this was produced in Manchester, because the north of England was really the the hotbed of, we'll say, entertainment by sport. Football started off in the north of England, really because of all the mills and workers, and you know, they'd all go 
do the day's shift and then they go home and kick a ball about. And, you know, this is where the football league all, all started there in the northwest of England. So... Uh, this my this this paper was out there, and they used to advertise in that. And there's some incredible adverts in that. I mean, I can remember one that uh, was: if you don't think that Foster's running shoes are the best running shoes you've ever had, we'll give you a hundred pounds. Now, can you imagine in the early start of twentieth century, nine, the, the first decade of uh, the, you know, 1900 to nineteen ten, a hundred pounds in those days? I, I mean, that's how much would it be today? Ten grand. <laughs> a lot of money today. So, and he, he used to do this. And he would also say all these athletes, they wore Foster's runner shoes to break the world record, 800 meters world record, well, meters, 880 yards. <laughs> you know, in those days, we only had yards. We didn't have, uh, yeah. we didn't have meters. But uh, so he would say, who, who was winning? It? And all these adverts, we didn't know, Jeff and I, you know, we left the family business events. But Jeff and I, we didn't know that much about grandfather. Yeah, we knew he'd done a bit of this, but luckily, you know, Reebok became pretty big and we were able to go send a guy, go and, go and dig into these, these papers and he would go to the library um, day in, day out and just find little adverts like this at the bottom of paper <laughs> pages, and, you know, which would say Foster's were doing this, Foster's were doing that. Yeah, so that was his method of advertising, but also in the uh, athletics uh, event magazine sort of thing, he, he would do that and we'd go around to all the events. You know, he, he was very well known about you know out and about in Lancashire. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing like in your, once you left school in your later years, like in your teens, going into your twenties? That was that a vision to then maybe start your own brand or work in the family business, or were you kind of going to do your own thing in life? Well, in your late teens, you're a teenager, aren't you? Yeah. You don't have anything else to do but enjoy life. You know, mm -hmm. girls were coming into your life and, you know, this was that. But at 18, 18, well, well, Jeff was older than me. I was 18, he was 20. We both went to do national service at the same time. That takes you away from what you were doing. You know, local dancing, local whatever it is. Uh, we, were, we were both in the scouts and... I think that helped us really in a way because that gave us a bit of independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at, uh, at 18, we went away in two years of national service. You know, mother's no longer making the bed, doing the washing, making your food, and uh, you've got to look after yourself. And you begin to learn a little bit of independence and, you know, okay, like I'm okay, Jack, you know, and get on with life. <clears throat> so when we came back, and my grandfather died in 1933. I wasn't born until 35, so I never knew it, but I was born on his birthday. Because I was born on his birthday, my grandma, she insisted I brought my name with me. He was called Joseph William, so I'm called Joseph William, or in short, we're both Joe. And uh, his, his sons had taken over the business. He died in 33, so my father and uncle, who were five years between them, they took over the business, and uh, they just didn't get on. Well, you know, you're 50% of a business and you, you sort of, what are you doing? You've got to work together in order for that business to, to thrive. And I think this is probably the big reason why they never really took advantage of the fact that they were, in those days, probably the number one athletics footwear company, being football, whatever, rugby. They, he had a big business. But you've got to remember, in those days, athletic shoes were performance. Now, we're all fashion companies. Now we're street. And this is where the volume comes from, going street. But those in those days, it was just performance. And you had to have a fair bit of money, you know, to be an athlete in those days, uh, even through the 20s. If you weren't rich, you couldn't go to the Olympics. <laughs> you had to pay your own way. Yeah, there was no funding back then. Ah, no funding back then. So, you know, uh, life was doing nothing. But when Jeff and I came back out of the forces and we came back, we, we sort of learned a bit more about life and we looked at it and we saw a failing company. J.W. Foster and Sons were just failing badly. They had no sales representatives. They, they did no marketing. They just did advertising in the magazines they'd always advertised in, which was a football magazine, Rugby World, things like that. And, of course, the retail, you know, High Street was beginning to get more important than 
people reading the magazine and they were going buying their uh, their products through local sports shops. And by the time Jeff and I actually, in 1958, decided we'd leave the parent company and we set up on ourselves, by that time, Adidas was in the UK and Adidas owned football. They'd taken it and we'd no money. <laughs> so we, we'd no chance. To try and get into football would have been impossible because of the amount of money we didn't have it. So we, we sort of stayed with athletics. And we became known as probably the athletic shoe company in the UK. How was that then to do your own thing? Was there any family politics that, that you left the kind of family name or to do well, your own thing? Or was they, were they proud of you and happy for you to do your own thing? Not at the not at the start. I mean, yeah. when when we left, it was a bit of a. <clears throat> my father was a bit sort of. I wouldn't say upset. He was, was sort of. What are you doing this for? And uh, I remember that day going into the office and saying, "Look, that Jeff and I are leaving. We're going to set up on our own." Why? You know, I mean, we've gone through the argument many times that this business is failing, and all my father could say is, "Look, when your uncle's gone and I'm gone, this is yours." And I'm saying, but Dad. We don't want you to go. <laughs> That's not the plan, you know. But this business will be gone long before you are, so there'll be no business for us. So we've gone through that argument and said, why don't we set up something on our own between us? But he wouldn't. He was sort of, ah, that was it. I don't know whether going through two world wars, you know, he'd, he'd been through the uh, First World War and the Second World War, whether that takes the fight out of you, I, I don't know. To me, it was the fact that uh, somewhere along here, he didn't get on with uh, with his brother. And all they were interested in is, this is a job. We make some money. And we can go to the pub at night. We can enjoy yeah. ourselves. You know, we're a bit better off than the neighbours. And that was it. It wasn't a matter of, uh, this is a business. And, uh, you know, we've got to, where's this business going to take us? Um, they accepted, basically. They accepted where they accepted were. Accepted like. is, yeah, his his place in life, and that was it. Um, and I don't know why initially Jeff and I thought we could do something big. I think it was probably because we could talk to each other, as we did. We were only two years between us. And, you know, we never fell out. <laughs> we never, we didn't live in each other's pocket. We weren't, we weren't going out with each other. You know, we each had our own friends. But as far as working together, you know, it was great. I guess, I guess, probably I was the more pushy one. I, you know, I was the one that had to go and tell my, dad, my father we're leaving, mm -hmm. and he he just got up, picked up a a, a letter opener, and thought it was coming toward him with a letter opener, and he gave it to me. He says, "Stab me now." You know, I said, dad, this you know, this is not like that. You know, it's like we have to we have to do something because Foster's is dying, and uh, we've got a life to live. So, yeah. that, you know. Where to leave? Yes, change is always hard, and I think a lot of people just accept that as well. If they're getting a wage and just accepting somewhere where they're not happy in, and that's why I think a lot of people struggle because they just accept the shitty jobs they're in or the shitty lives that they're in because they think there's nothing else out there. But to actually step back and go, wait a minute, like you'd probably in your dad's mind you've probably broke his heart, but in your mind you knew that you wanted something different, your own platform, your own life to do and take things to another level, like you say, if going through two world wars. As the fire go where he's been through and seen so much pain that he's just accepted and happy to live the life that he had, but you've obviously young and and want more and want to take things that how how much does that plays a part to kick on? Did you have not prove your dad wrong, but to show him that it was the right decision to make that? Well, it, it it took a while for him to uh, accept the fact that yes, we we'd started a company that was uh, you know it was going going for a future. We were, we were not sort of this is not just earning a living. In fact, it, in those early days, it was difficult to earn a living. Um, I mean, my wife on a number of occasions in those days used to sort of say, "Why don't you go and get a proper job?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and uh, I'm saying, well, hmm. I don't know what I want to do. And I think that, you know, half the thing is if you want to do it and you're enthusiastic about it, you're enjoying it. Mm, yeah, maybe the family weren't enjoying it because maybe I was. And in those early days, that's tough. And people say, how do you sort of uh, measure a, a business and life that you're doing when you're working as against the family life? And uh, it was tough in those early days, you know, really tough. And, okay, I, I started off. For maybe two years, I'm working with my brother. We're working ourselves in, in the work, making shoes. Then, you know, somebody had to 
get out and do things. And uh, so I'm saying, we've got to do this, got to do this. And Jeff said, look, I'll keep, I'll look after the factory. And he loved the factory. He just loved making shoes. He said, you do everything else. Okay, um, what's everything else? So that's, you know, trying to build a business. So I, I get in the car and go out and try and sell the product. And I learned a lot with that. I'd go into a sports shop and uh, say, you know, uh, back there, I'm, I'm from Reebok. You know, first question, who's Reebok? You know, well, we're a small company and we're making uh, athletic shoes, running shoes and whatever, showing the product. Yeah, it's a nice product, that. Hmm. Uh, and then you say, well, look, I've got Adidas, I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? And, you know, that, was a, that to me was a, a question. Why do I need Reebok? I didn't try and tell him why I needed Reebok. I'm thinking, he doesn't need me. <laughs> he doesn't, he told me he's got Adidas and he's got Dunlop. And he's telling me, he doesn't need Reebok. And that was a question. Well, yeah, we had to go back. So I stopped being a rep in those days. Yeah, get, get out of the car, end of story. Right. Um, we used to go to athletics meetings, cross-country events and all this, and um, we'd sell it to the back of the car. And I'm, I'm there one day, I'm looking and thinking, just a minute, these are the guys, these are my customers, you know, the retailer. He's not my customer. The sports shop, he's not there. These are my customers. And we were, we were very lucky. I don't know if it still applies today, but the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association, produced a magazine, um, a, a book. And, the, and in this book, must have been four, maybe 500 athletic clubs throughout the country. The name and address of all the secretaries were in this book. No brainer. Out goes a letter to every one of the secretaries. Look, we'll give you 15% off if you'll sort of introduce our product. And if somebody in the uh, club wants to be our agent, they can have the 15%. Okay, I got 100 uh, agents from that first letter. Well, I mean, that was brilliant. All, all of a sudden, I'm in every all 100 athletic clubs. A second letter went out, and I think I got another 50. I ended up with about 250 agents out of probably four to 500 all, altogether. Well, that was keeping us busy. Then I was getting calls from these sports stores in the middle of the town. I believe you're selling direct to our athletic club. Um, yes, of course. Um, well, look, if you stop doing that, we'll stock your shoes. Well, now, I, now he needed me now. <laughs> he needed me because I'm taking his custom. And I thought, no, no, I'm not going to stop selling direct. But I only give them 15%. You can give athletes 15%. I'm sure you do for a club. Give a club 15%. And you'll get wholesale price, which is more than 50% off. So, uh, but I won't stop selling direct because, to me, that's my way of marketing the shoes. <clears throat> oh, I think 90% of these retailers accepted that. 10% just said, oh, no, I'm not going to bother. But 90% accepted it. So then we got into the stores. So uh, you know, that's how our business started, started to build. And because we were now in the retail stores, and I, I had friends, um, and one of them came along and said, why don't you let us do your distribution? So at that point, I thought, wow, that's great, because then the, the factory then can just sort of make shoes and all our product is sold because we, we have now a distributor and I can just concentrate on doing the marketing. <coughs> so that's how we got a distributor. But that proved to be a bad choice in the end. Why? Well, it's, it's not that the choice was wrong. It's just that uh, the company I went with, it was a, a family company and the, uh, well, the man who owned it, he was getting on in life. I think he was about 70 years old then. And, um, 18 months into the contract, he decided to retire and allow his son-in-law to come in. My friend was head of marketing and sales. He was a salesman. So the owner's son-in-law came in to run the company. My friend, they just did not get on at all. So my friend left and went to join Barta. Set, in fact, set up the sports division of Barta. And uh, the son-in-law, of course, he was an engineer. He had no idea about footwear, no idea about marketing. And, of course, when my uh, my friend left to go to uh, Varta, he took the sales force with him. <laughs> they all went with him. So this company had no sales. He made a couple of really stupid decisions, and within 12 months, they were out of business. They're gone. 
Um, it's in my book, if you read it. It's one of those things, you know, I mean, when you make a decision, can you legislate that that's going to happen within 12 months? Probably not. But the decision was okay, maybe all your eggs in one basket. 80% of our production was going through Reebok Lame and that channel. 20% I had with making a few shoes for other people and climbing boots and whatever. So uh, that almost put it out of business because they, were not, they couldn't pay us. I had to go and collect 2,000 pairs of shoes that they had from our production. I go collect them back. They hadn't paid for them. So I brought them back down there with a van, bring them back to the factory. I had to lay off about 60% um, of all our employees. And that, that was hard, you know. And some of those guys said, look, we'll, we'll work for nothing, you know. We'll, we'll help or, we'll, you know, we... Uh, can we come back when 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 it's when, when things are good again? Mm -hmm. I was like, of course you can come back when you know, but we can't we can't let people come here and we'll not pay you. But uh, you know, go get yourself another job and uh, we'll let you know. Three months later, we had them all back, and uh, that's because all the friends I knew, even the guy who gone to Barter to set up uh, the sports division, said, "Look, we need two hundred pairs of shoes a week, a particular shoe that we made that was really a." successful shoe can you make us 200 pairs and then we had two or three other companies Stylo you probably won't know they're, they're not part of the British Shoe Corporation they're in Leeds but they, they had high street shops they also wanted a sports shoe so all of a sudden our, our factory became busy again and the 200 the 2000 pairs of shoes we decided that what we would do go around to all the schools within a 50 mile radius get all the uh, PE teachers and make them an agent. You, you sell our shoes. And we actually sold those shoes at a better price than we had through the, through the distributor. Mm -hmm. So we got a better price. It took us a bit of time to do it. But, and again, we were getting cash. Yeah, we didn't have to wait. We got it. And so we survived that. Um, How was that, Joe, when you feel as if your business is losing? And you, was there ever a time where you thought, I'm not going to carry on anymore because you've lost so many staff, you were losing money, you were getting products sent back. That, or was it just to decide, okay, I need to work harder to get all the staff back and take it to another level? How hard is that for business, for people who's maybe want to be an entrepreneur or involved in business? I think a lot of people quit faster instead of pushing through the obstacles and or jumping over them and to kick on. Like, how hard is that to, to push on when you think, okay, I maybe I've failed here? Well, you know, there's a couple of days when you, you wonder what, what the hell happened. Why did that? How could that have happened? And then you know you, you think no no we we've come through we've come through a name change because we started off our uh, Mercury, business as Mercury, Mercury Sports with Mercury Sports Footwear, and uh, that in itself is a story. But we've gone from that. We uh, we had a, four years into our business, we had a letter from uh, Adidas lawyers saying that uh, we had two stripes. Our silhouette was two stripes and a T-bar, and they thought well, they told us that that infringed the three stripe mark. And again, five minutes, we're looking at this letter and thinking, oh my God, what, what do we do now? And then it dawns on us, just a minute, Adidas, no, we're here. <laughs> Adidas think it necessary to tell us that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Great, fantastic. Yeah, we're here. So what do we do? Well, we, we change our silhouette and we, we put on what is now the vector, which is a side... In fact, we got the idea from the tail fin of the British Airways. British Airways, they called it Speedbird, which was sort of an arrow shape. And they, they had that. Now, now they have the Union Jack on the back. But uh, it was called Speedbird. And uh, we uh, thought, well, yeah, we just adapt that a bit and put that on. Great. That's better. So we, we, we've been used to uh, challenges. And, and I think that was sort of almost an upbringing for me. I think that was the ed education maybe I'd missed when I was between four and 10 years old. And uh, I, I got an education. Yeah, now, these challenges, you know, you're doing something wrong. Nobody would challenge it if you were doing something very right, really right. You know, there's something that you need to change. Okay, so change it. And, and I think those experiences, and it's the same with the, the distributor. So I put a distributor on, okay, there was something wrong in that. Yeah, because you've lost control of something. And that's the selling. You've lost control of that. Um, so you change. And, and, and I think it was the same when, when they did go and we had, we had to take our workforce down by 60%. It was like, okay, 
uh, we've got to be more in control in the future. And so you learn so many things. And you know, I think it's that challenge that doesn't say, oh, my God, you know, why, why is this happening to us? No, there's a reason. It, you know, you're meant to be challenged. And if, you, if you're going to succeed, you find a way. And for us, it was always, can we turn this problem into an advantage? And for the most part, all we did was to turn it into an advantage. You know, make people uh, like you. You know, it's like you're selling your name, you're selling Reebok. And it was all about selling Reebok as a, as a name, which, you know, over that period of time, we did do. And everybody looked, as far as athletics were concerned, we were the number one athletic company in the country. They looked to us as the experts. Do you think that's the key to success then, is just pushing through the challenges? I think, well... I mean, the, the, there must be a numerous, numerous ways yeah. of doing that. Mm. But this is this is one. I think, I think pushing through the challenges help makes you stronger, because it's surprising how many people uh, come onto your side. You enjoy the fact that you've done this and say, "Wow, great!" You know, they, they, they're with you. And, and I think it's also selling that enthusiasm. You know, you're not going to be going around with people and saying, "Oh, I don't want to do." Our distributors gone bust them. We could go bust with it. You know, that was never the attitude. It was, wow, hmm, what do we do? How can we get around this? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I think that sort of challenge is, uh, that's the entrepreneur. Take the risks. Face, face the challenges. You know, and you know, if you don't take a risk, I don't think you actually can use the word entrepreneur. Yeah. You know? and it's what makes it. Mm -hmm. Do you remember selling your first trainer? Your first shoe? Uh, not really. No. I mean, yeah, I mean it's. Uh, I I guess when you start off in business, you're just glad you're selling anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we got. And Jeff was more of an athlete than I was. I'm. I was a badminton player, so I'm sort of a sprinter, quick a mover. Uh, Jeff was sort of a plodder. You know, he, he could run for twenty, thirty miles, you know, and still come back. But uh, and uh, I think he also likes his cycling and he uh, used to race his cycling as well. So he used to have a lot of connections and our probably our early days were just all his friends who were in the athletics and uh, and cycling. And I was more badminton, we couldn't make badminton shoes. That was a that's a Dunlop process in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to change the name from Mercury Sports Footwear to you come up with the name Reebok, and yes. the name Reebok is it from a is that a gazelle? It's a gazelle. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. I googled it a couple of days ago because I wanted really? to know. Yeah, just because I knew you were coming on today. It's right. not as if I'm knowledgeable. <laughs> I just uh, remember it stuck. So that's where. You, so what was the the name behind Reebok? Why was it that one that you chose? That is now <laughs> global name. Well, I mean, the funny thing is that we were Mercury, and eighteen months into our business, we were doing nicely. And our, our accountant is looking at the books and saying, look, guys, you're doing pretty well. Uh, this is okay. You better register your name. Um, you know, we're 23, 24, Jeff 20. And in those days, we were quite naive. And, you know, but, oh, well, you know, we couldn't be Foster's because there was already a Foster's company. You know, already. And uh, we said, oh, why? And he said, well, he said, uh, you're doing pretty nicely. And, other people will look at this and say, oh, well, we'll make some Mercury shoes as well. And if they do, you can't stop them because you've not registered the name. And that way you'll have a lot of costs going to court or doing whatever to stop them doing it. So register your name. Okay, how do I do that? So I said, well, uh, you go and see a patent agent. You know, they look after all that sort of stuff and uh, uh, get it registered. So uh, Wilson Gunnellis in Manchester, I went to see uh, Mr. Ellis and said, look, we need to register Mercury. He checked it out and said, well, it's somebody else's name. We'll see, but they're not using it. And it was Lotus and Delta, part of British Shoe Corporation. And they came back and said, no, we're not using it, but uh, we'll sell it to you for £1,000. And I said, we've not got £1,000. What can we do? And uh, he said, well, you can always take it in the court because not using it and say, you know, because not using it, uh, you can have it. How much will that cost us? He said about a thousand pounds. Oh, right. I said, well, we can't do that. He said, well, look, if you can't do that, you, you're going to have to find a new name. Okay. All right. Mm, new name. And he said, but don't bring me one name. Bring me, bring me 10, 12. And I said, what? You know, this is our business. 
10 or 12 names. I said, well, he said, if you bring me one at a time and we take this through the register, it's going to take about two months on each one to find if you can or you can't. And if you bring me five names and we can't do it, it's going to be almost a year. You can't do that. You've got to bring me enough and I can push them all through. Right, well, I mean, I don't know if you've sat down and thought, what shall we call our business, you know? And he was sitting around the table. And you get some stupid ideas as you do, you know. We were young, so we got some silly names coming up. But we got names like Falcon. Wow, Falcon Sports, that pretty good. Cougar, Cougar Sports, yeah. I'm going to take you back now to 1943. 1943, during the middle of World War II, I'm eight years old. And like with COVID, people couldn't go anywhere during the war. Nothing was going on. So it was all these stay-at-home things. And uh, we had a stay-at-home uh, athletics meeting, and I am entered into a 60-yard 60, 60 race. <clears throat> and I'm eight. Right. And I win the race. I had a bit of an advantage, though. I'm wearing Foster Spikes. Nobody else could afford Spikes in those days, if they ever even heard about the idea. I win. Fantastic. And uh, so I go up to the, uh, you know, collect my prize. Right? I'm ready for prize there. What do I get? A dictionary. You know, I'm, uh, I'm eight years old. Where's the football? You know, uh, a dictionary. Uh, and at the time I didn't, uh, didn't know it, but it was a Webster's dictionary. And a Webster's dictionary is an American dictionary. And if you can, uh, you know, there are many words which are different from an English Oxford dictionary. At the time, I didn't know. But anyway, disgustedly, I take my prize. <coughs> but now we're sitting around the table in 1960 and we're thinking of names. And I have my dictionary here, luckily. And uh, I like the letter R. Ah, yeah. Well, I open my dictionary on the letter R and I'm thumbing through R. Very soon I come across R-W-B-O-K. And I'm thinking, what's that? It's a small South African gazelle. Wow, we're a running company. Gazelle, that's it. Fantastic, top of the list. So I went back to Mr. Ellis with our 10 names and I said, look, we've got to be in love with this. Yeah, this is, this is our, our business. We live in this. We want that one. And of course, you know, being a sort of... Um, Solicitor type as well, you know, let's see, it's up to you and all these other names. Anyway, it took him about two weeks to come back. And uh, when he did, he said, look, the only one that really comes clear of everything is Reebok. Wow. Just one caveat. The registrar says, if uh, somebody comes along making shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. Well, I mean, I ask you, who would do that? No. Nobody would make shoes out of Reebok skin. That's, that's stupid. <laughs> well, so we become Reebok. <laughs> no, that's us. We, we don't change our name, we become Reebok. Ten years after, oh, the registrar said, because of the, uh, the fact that somebody can make it out of Reebok skin, we're going to put you in the B section of the register. And again, we had no idea what the B section is against any other section. But ten years later, he came back and said, we moved you to the A section. He said, because everybody now knows that Reebok is a sports shoe, and the animal is sort of incidental. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how, uh, yeah, we became Reebok. <laughs> that's a mad story, though, that to be, so they thought potentially you could have been skinning the, the Reeboks and, and putting them through a shoe, like people do with crocodiles and <laughs> get letters and stuff like that. Right. A weird sports shoe, though, if you had fur from it. Um, so seeing you start moving through the like the ranks and start making a name, that like Reebok then becomes a global brand, like, does the work ethic become more or does it become less? Like how, how how did you manage to keep pushing? Because with success comes true sacrifice. Like how's it how did you manage to keep the workload or the balance and enjoy? Because we were speaking coming up on the left and we we're talking about balance because I'm trying to work to create and, and it's non stop. But <laughs> I don't I'm, it's not as if I'm not enjoying the journey, but you don't really seem to take notes of it because you're so caught up in trying to make something of your life. But so see when you're doing that, like how much sacrifice goes towards creating something so special? I don't think you recognize the sacrifice. Now, certainly we didn't in those early days. Okay, I, as I say, my wife used to say, why don't you go and get a proper job? You know, and uh, I'm thinking, you know, well, 
must be something wrong with this one, but you know, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's still moving forward. You know, yeah. we're still doing it. There's still questions being asked and there's still places to go. Um, and, you know, running athletics in the UK in those days wasn't very big. You know, it was only a small, well, I mean, we, we more or less owned it, but uh, we could see that Nike and people like that were coming in and they would, they would take a, a good bite of it if we're not. So we needed uh, something else. <clears throat> and I'd always thought about America because in America, every college, every uh, university has a coach and coach is God in these places. And you can go there on a sports scholarship. So athletics in America was big. Fantastic. I've got to get to America. Even Foster's had managed to, to get a deal with Yale University. They were making 200 pairs of shoes a month. Uh, and the guys at Yale, a guy called uh, Frank Ryan and the other one, Bob Jack, they were head coaches. And they were selling those around the USA to other universities and whatever. So I wanted to go there. And uh, there were protests. The family, well, you, you can't afford to go to America and start to dig around the houses. You know, we don't have that sort of money, right? However, I'm reading a magazine. I think it's called Eurosport. And the magazine, there's an advertisement here from the government. We want you to export. Oh, wow. Uh, we'll pay for you a stand at the NSGA show. That's the National Sporting Goods of America. We'll pay for that stand, and we'll also pay your return airfare. And 50% of your hotel bill and expenses whilst you're there. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's cheaper going to America, isn't it, for a few days <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and whatever. So no more no more resistance to me going to America. And uh, with a friend, I signed up for this and we went to America. And, I, you know, the government were going to pay for the airfare, return airfare, but we, we decided we'd take a, um, a discounted airfare, but you've got to stay there for two weeks. I don't know why we did that. You know, they used to do it in those days. If you stayed for two weeks, it was cheaper than just going in and, you know, an outward and a return sort of ticket. I don't know why we did that, but uh, we did. And we went to New York, first of all, and um, my friend Bob Brigham, Brigham, they have uh, outdoor shops all the way through UK these days. Um, he, he was looking at the outdoor stores in, in New York. I, I looked at the sports stores. Uh, that was great. And we, we had a few days there. And then we went on to Chicago. And Chicago, February. This is February. Uh, first week in February. And uh, we went about three foot of snow. It was freezing. Absolutely freezing. I'd, I'd never never been in weather like that before. But anyway, this, the, the exhibition is on four days. And uh, people are coming up and saying, well, oh, like your shoes, where do we get them? I'm saying England. And saying, is that New England? <laughs> uh, no, 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 not New England. England, across the water, you know. it's uh, Oh, not near London? Yeah, <laughs> near London. Uh, I did realize that um, I needed a distributor. <laughs> Back to the problem. I got to get a distributor in the USA. This is 1968. When did I get into the USA? 1979. I got my, dis my, well, the distributor that worked. Why? I had six different distributors during that time. And in the book, Shu Lang, he's a guy from um, Philadelphia. And he tried hard for two or three years, but somehow we couldn't, we couldn't get in there. And, uh, however, luck was on our side. During the 70s, Running in uh, in America became a big category. Everybody goes out running, training, starting 10K events. So from when I started in 1968, running is just really track and field, like it was in the UK. But running starts being on the road and people got training, and this is growing, growing massively. And the magazine, um, they started off with a, a single page, A4, called Runner's World. By 1975, that was a 50 to 100 pages of glossy, colored magazine with all the information you could want if you were up there running, where the next 10K races were, who won the last 10K races. <clears throat> so it was all the information. Anybody out there running would get the magazine. And you think, we've got 350 million Americans, 10% are out there running, 35 million. Wow, a lot of people to buy the magazine. And Bob Anderson, who produced the magazine, decided because he was doing so well, he could tell everybody which was the number one shoe to buy. He did. Nike. Oh, right. 
Phil Knight. I'm sure he's a nice guy. I've not met him yet, but one of these days I hope to. Phil Knight. Yeah, number one shoe. Where's he getting his shoes from? He's getting his shoes from Japan. And all of a sudden, we'll say 10% of the 35 million want that shoe because the Americans do. So 3.5 million people probably wanted to buy Nike's shoe. How can, how can he get them to turn up the wick and to get those products? He couldn't. By the time he's getting those, enough shoes in to satisfy demand, Bob Anderson of Runner's World said, ah, oh, no, it's 12, another number one shoe. And I think it was New Balance. However, same story. They couldn't produce enough. So Bob Anderson, either somebody helped him change his mind because the retail business, were, they were absolutely head, you know, head in hand saying, what's going on here? Because they couldn't get the shoe everybody wanted. And when they could, Bob Anderson had changed to another shoe. So somebody, <clears throat> it changed. Changed to become a star rating. And Bob Anderson said, right, the top shoe will be five star rated. Now you could get four or five of those, which meant you know, there was a spread that was much better. And I knew at that time, I knew we could make a five-star shoe. You know, that was our business. We were in there. We, we knew what was required. A number one shoe was a bit of a lottery. It was a question of, well, who did most advertising in Runner's World and who did, you know, who was local? Well, Nike were always local to uh, Runner's World. <clears throat> Runner's World at Los Altos, and it was quite near San Francisco. So uh, anyway, we knew we could do a five-star shoe, which I did. I designed a five-star shoe, and... Uh, by 1978, we'd tested this out in Edmonton at the Commonwealth Games. And actually, we tested out the gold range. And Aztec, which was our trainer, which would be five stars, uh, that was a training shoe. We had a racing shoe called Midas and a spike shoe called Inca. And we got a, a, a shed load of medals, gold and all sorts of stuff, at the Commonwealth. So by February, back in Chicago, I've got my Aztec would-be five-star shoe, and they're on display. And I get um, Kmart. Well, running was becoming so big that Kmart wanted to get into the scene, and they came along and said, look, we want 25,000 pairs. Mm, right, about six months worked that for our factory. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, but we want a better price. Mm. Well, the six months work. My friend who'd gone to Barter, he'd said, because I said, look, if we get a five-star shoe, we cannot cope with our factory. We'll help. So Barter would help make that. And then they said, well, want a better price. Oh, okay, that's South Korea. <coughs> me. Okay, so we get a better price in South Korea. Well, I'd already, uh, again, had uh, connected with an agent for a South Korean uh, factory. So I thought, that's fair enough. Right. And I'm thinking, yeah, mm -hmm, that's good. Kmart. Okay. But along came Paul Fireman. Paul Fireman, he was running Boston Camping small outdoor outlet outfit in uh, in Boston, of course, and they were doing tents, fishing rods and whatever. And I got on well with Paul. I mean, came out as something so big, Paul was just a small company. And uh, so we got on well and he said, uh, look, Joe, you get a five-star shoe and I'll be your distributor. Okay, I said, look at Aztec. He said, yeah, yeah. I know he said, it's a great shoe. But it's not got five stars yet, has it? No, not yet. Okay, we're in February, and the shoe uh, the shoe magazine comes out in uh, August. <coughs> well, I say it comes out last week in July, usually the August edition. Uh, so in between February and August, I, I go across and I meet up with Kmart. Uh, I go to reception, and I'm asking for I think it was Mr. Biasante. He had seen us in uh, in uh, Chicago. And she said, go across to the in that warehouse and he's rum, number, whatever it is, row, row, whatever it is, number seven. And I, I went to this place and there must be 100, 150 buyers all at their desks. So I figure out where my man is and go and sit with him. I'm looking around and thinking, this is a big organization. <clears throat> this might be my first order for 25,000 pairs of shoes, but it also might be my last order for 25,000 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, So I think, okay. And I left there and I went to Boston and uh, Paul picked me up at the airport, went to his the small outfit. <coughs> he was running that with his brother, Steve, and his, his brother-in-law. They, they were running this company. But they'd been doing it for 10 years and you know, you're going around the same thing for 10 years not going anywhere Paul obviously wanted to move on get something going 
So uh, I thought, well, yeah, it's great. Paul, fantastic. You know, I'm going to go with Paul. Nice little outfit there. They, you know, they can sort of bolt this on and re we'll get into America. However, we started to have a five-star shoe. So it's the last week in July, and I pick up the phone to Paul. I said, Paul, can you go down to the local kiosk? I'm sure Runner's World will be out now and see how we did. An hour later, Paul came back. Joel, <laughs> you got five stars, Aztec, five stars. Oh, brilliant, that was it. He said, but also, he said, your Midas and Inca, the Spike and the Race issue, they also got five stars. So we entered the market with three five-star shoes. That was Reebok. We made it, we'd crack the market. What's that feeling like then, Joe, for like over 10 years trying to crack a market to then take you to a global scale? Like, do you celebrate or is it straight back into the office to keep pushing to be a success? Like, oh, we did both. <laughs> 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 do you think that's where you've got to find the balance? Because sometimes you've been caught up in work so much that you actually forget to live. Even though you are living to create something special, but you know what I mean? Because life's yeah. about enjoying, laughing, like fucking hell, like... I love to laugh and joke, but over the last three years, I'm only creating a podcast, but I feel as if I've kind of lost myself because I'm constantly working and, I, and I've kind of forgot the old me who never really just, who never really, if I'm honest, gave a fuck and just used to live life to the extreme, but it's kind of went to, it becomes an obsession in my mind, but like, did you have that also, that like, were you obsessed to create something special or was it just enjoyment that you've then like planted a seed that was blossomed into something amazing. I think you have to be obsessed. Yeah. yeah. To be successful, to be, you know, to penetrate through those barriers, those problems, the things that are there. You know, to be able to, your glass is always half full. It's never half full. You've got to have that optimism. You've know, you got to be that way in, in life. You, you can't worry about what you're missing because, you know, what are you missing? You, 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 you really are obsessed by saying, now we've got it. Now's our chance. Let's push it hard. And uh, so you um, you enjoy all the successes. And okay, up until that point, yeah, there are challenges with your family. You know, it's um, I'm traveling, I'm jumping on an airplane, I'm going places like you. You spend four days a week down here and the family's back up there in mm -hmm. Scotland. And uh, you're thinking, what am I missing? Well, one of these days they'll come with you yeah. and they'll enjoy four days here. And you'll enjoy it. There'll be different things. It will change. You'll still be obsessed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll still be making a success out of something because you can't accept anything less. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't want to be second best. Yeah, definitely not. No. Nah. You don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, there's no position there. You don't see that. You know, no, I'm the best. And it, you're not looking at the, uh, the other people who are doing whatever you're doing. You're looking at what you're doing. You know, you're the one that's doing this. I'm going, you're going places. That's what we were you know, with Reebok. You know, we weren't bothered about Nike. We know they, they were big. Adidas, they were big. But everybody's doing their thing. And we're not sort of saying, now, how can we challenge these? How can we? we weren't challenging people. We were challenging ourselves. The challenge was the market. The challenge was out there. And, and for us, it was, how do we take Reebok to another step? And, you know, this, you get these, these strokes of luck. Things happen. We were doing nicely as a running company, and that was okay. But we had a guy down in um, down in LA, Arnold Martinez. He was a tech rep, and a tech rep, in as far as we were concerned, they used to go into the stores and talk to the salespeople. You know, they weren't trying to sell the shoes; they were talking to the salespeople, saying, "These are the good things about the shoe. It does this. It does this. This. This is all." So that when when they're selling the shoe, people come in and saying, "Which are the best shoes?" Hopefully, and. They call it spiffing as well. Spiffing is where uh, if if you're a salesman and you sell a pair of Reebok, uh, we'll give you a dollar. Nothing to do with the company. We'll give you a dollar because you sold a pair of Reebok. I call it mm -hmm. spiffing. And I never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, this is, you know, you, you sort of light up the salespeople so that, yeah, we're going to sell Reebok. Great stuff. Anyway, Arnold's wife, Frankie, she's going to aerobic classes. And I'll say, what, what was that? Aerobic classes. Because she's loving it. She's coming in and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, we're actually exercising the music. And we love it. Oh, her and her friends were going every one of these. She said, can I come down and have a look what's going on? 
next uh, next one of these classes going on. He went down there, and the instructor's up there doing whatever, and she's in a pair of uh, sneakers. All right? Half the class are wearing the same sneaker that she's wearing. The other half, they're not wearing any sneakers. That was it. All right. This was a light bulb moment for Arthur. He thought, why don't we make a shoe specifically for these girls doing what they're doing on a woman's last, just in women's sizes? He's in L.A., and, of course, the company's up in Boston. So he took the red eye overnight up to uh, flight, up to Boston, see Paul Feynman. And he's in the Paul Feynman. He's full of this. And he's saying to Paul, Paul, look, you know, these girls, it's going to be fantastic. It really, it's called aerobics. You know? Even Paul saying, aerobics, what the hell is that, you know? Don't know that. Okay, and he's saying, look, it's, it's going to be big. And Paul's saying, Arthur, slow down, slow down. We're a running company, and we're doing very nicely. Why do we want to be making dancing shoes? We're a running company. Uh, Arnold's saying, well, you know, this is going to be, he said, you keep your eye on it, you know, and if it does anything, we'll, you know, we'll see what we can do. Okay, Arnold wasn't satisfied. Yeah, he, he went he went around to the back door and he saw a guy called um, Steve Liggett. He my uh, let's see, my assistant that will tell me <laughs> when, when I when I forget my external memory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Steve Liggett, go and see Steve Liggett, and uh, and he persuaded Steve. He said, Steve, we want a shoe. Tell him all about it. Made out of glove leather, uh, nice and cushioned. And making a, a woman's last, which is narrower than the sort of, uh, what we say, the fit old last sort of thing, everybody's like the unisex last. M making a woman, adjusting women's sizes, right? Okay. Um, so he got 200 pairs of these shoes. Steve actually made them, got them made, and that's it. Takes them down, give them to the instructors and, uh, and some of the leading girls, and they love them. Absolutely loved them. And then when Jane Fonda actually went out and bought a pair to use in her exercise videos, that was it. It just took off. Because the girls weren't just wearing them for their aerobics. They were wearing them out and about. They went to work in them, put the heels in a bag and changed when they got to wherever. They just loved the shoes. Absolutely loved them. And it started to grow. Uh, one big problem, they were making them out of uh, glove leather. Well, glove leather is just like a piece of paper. Thin. You can it's thin. You can rip it. it. Just rips, and of course, these shoes are starting to come apart after about four weeks, a month, or whatever. They they're falling apart. Had this been in any other part of the world apart from uh, Los Angeles in America, I'm sure that Reebok at that point would have gone out of business totally because somebody would have said, "No, we're not doing it." But the girls love them. They just wanted to bought another pair, and that was it. It took about uh, a month maybe a couple of months to get to cure that problem and use more garment leather than glove leather, which was much stronger and could do the job. How is that then when you get <coughs> teething problems? If you see a product that it's booming, but then you see a lot of faults with it, does it just change the fault straight away so you get the better product for next time and hopefully people buy back? Because if you get a product, something goes wrong, not necessarily this, the, a big percentage you come back and buy again. Like, how do you rectify that? Do you just change it straight away? We well, see, as I've said, this is Los, America, this is Los Angeles, this mm -hmm. is America. That's a, probably the only place in the world where they wouldn't say, oh, we're not going to buy those again. No, I love them. They love them that much. They just went out and bought another pair. You know, they had the disposable income. They were able to do that um, in other places. And, you know, I didn't know anything about this. I, I'm, I'm back in the UK. And this is going on in America. And the uh, first thing I hear about it is that uh, we're making shoes out of glove leather. And I'm saying, glove leather? I'm a shoemaker. My book even says that. I'm a shoemaker. Glove leather? You don't make shoes out of glove leather. I'm, I'm saying that. And yet we actually made World 10 out of uh, glove leather. But we reversed it. So we were using the suede side. The uh, aerobic shoe that we're using the skin side, so they had to take a bit of the skin off to get the adhesive to go in, which meant something which was uh, probably about 0.7 of a millimeter when you start. You take it down to half a millimeter. Can you imagine half a millimeter so that you can get the adhesive in? And I'm saying you can't do that. Absolutely, you can't do that. That's ridiculous. Stop whatever you're doing. They didn't. Mm -hmm. We're talking about marketing now and the difference. They lined it with nylon to give it the strength. Oh, brilliant. 
why have you lined it with nylon? Well, it's breaking apart. Yeah, but, you know, you line it with nylon and it stops breathing. Leather breathes. You know, that's the idea of leather breathing. Oh, I won't breathe. Oh, what do we do? Oh, we'll punch holes in it. So they punch holes in it. A nice design on the front, punching holes in it so that we could get the breathing again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when I realized that marketing beats manufacturing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so see, in the 80s then, when you've got the aerobic shoe, and then Reebok Ren really makes a, a stand to being the number one sports brand in the world. But then after that, did you bring out the Reebok Pump, mm. which took it to another level? Is, that, is this correct? Or is the most successful oh, yeah. Reebok shoe out ever? The Reebok Pump? <laughs> the Reebok Pump. Yeah. And I think it's going to come back in a big, big way. Yeah. Now, 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 now we're with the ABG. But you know, when we, when we went down, we started off with aerobics were a $9 million shoe. Went to thirty million dollars, sixty million dollars, three hundred million dollars, and almost nine hundred million dollars in four years. That was the growth, and of course during that time, the men were looking at this this shoe, which only made in women's sizes on a woman's last, and they were hungry. But we couldn't satisfy anything else. It took all our time to satisfy the, the growing aerobic market. But when we got to a certain size, yes, we could take the technology. It was well. Once technology, it was really an idea of using soft leather to make shoes, to make sports footwear, because normally footwear is made of quite firm leather, so that when you make it and stand it there, it keeps its shape. Whereas when you use soft leather, it tends to just drop a bit and lose its shape. But uh, that became quite a feature. And so now we moved to tennis, we, we moved around into basketball and other sports because we, we're growing. And we're becoming the number one sports brand globally. We're overtaking Nike, overtaking Adidas. <coughs> and then, of course, it is all a matter of saying, right, innovation. We must innovate. So the innovations come along, and as you say, pump. That was fantastic. I mean, when D Brown there is sort of, you know, dunking from the halfway in, in this competition from the halfway line, and just dunking, and, and then he bends down and he pumps his shoes up. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, those sort of images are permanent. Timeless. Yeah, yeah, they just stick in people's minds. So, like you say, pump becomes famous. And, uh, and, and those sort of things, they have to continue. You have to continue uh, innovating, whatever it is, in whatever way. And you, you need the right influences as well. So, uh, yes, pump probably was the biggest. But by that time, we were a $4 billion company. So that man came in with a billion dollar idea about the aerobics and that was going to get put to the side because nobody really seen the vision. That's right. Ain't it mad though that people can have, like people have so many creative ideas and visions that probably speak in, probably speak about it all the time but never really put it into existence. Yeah. Like how happy were you when you, you realised that that was turning into a billion dollar like, product? Well, like, you know what? <laughs> Once it starts to grow that way, you're so busy. You, you, everybody's running around. Everybody's trying to get things happening. Yeah, I put on America and Paul Feynman is there because I knew the American market. That was it. I wouldn't need to do an awful lot of work on the other markets once that started going. And once it started going, I'm, I'm traveling the world. I'm putting on 30 other distributions over four or five years. All, all around the world. So I'm doing the global job. And uh, of course, everybody wants the aerobic shoe. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Everybody, and you know, the, the the challenge then was to satisfy demand. And luckily, you know, we grew from three hundred million dollar to a nine hundred million dollar in one year. You you've tripled your business. <clears throat> and it, financing it wasn't the problem at that time because you know once you get the things rolling, mm -hmm. the, the financing works easy enough. But how do you get the production? Just in the same way that when Runners World had said this is the number one shoe. Phil Knight couldn't get the production. We had to try and get the production up from $300 million revenue to $900 million revenue. And we were very lucky because Nike, who really, they'd all stood, stood back. They said, no, 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 aerobics, not quite performance sports as we know it, because Nike added us. Yeah, they were male, sweaty. Yeah, mm -hmm. We had become the woman's company. You know, you know how... Our ladies glowed. They didn't sweat, you know, we were a different mm -hmm. uh, approach. And this nice white shoe with the Union Jack there, fantastic. I mean, the Union Jack, the story behind that, because we had the, uh, and still have the Starcrest, which is on the, the tongue. 
tongue of everybody's shoe now. But we used to put that also on the side of the shoe, the Reebok name and this uh, Starcrest. <clears throat> and I'm with Paul Feynman one day, and Paul is saying, Joe, can we use the Union Jack there instead of the Starcrest? And I'm saying, well, could cause us some problems in the UK, that, uh, just putting it here because we're making the shoes in Korea. Um, I said, but, okay, yeah, we, we can do that. And I said, but why do you want that? He said, well, nobody knows the Starcrest. He said, but to me, it looks a bit like the Union Jack. He said, but everybody in America knows the Union Jack. Right. Everybody. And, you know, at that point, we, we had very few point of sale material, you know, things you could stick in a window to advertise. And <clears throat> what the retailers started doing, because the shoes were the Union Jack on each side, the box lid was a Union Jack. So they're sticking all these boxes in the window up like a pyramid and putting the shoe, shoes on. So, uh, so many of the retailers, and I used to go around photographing these, and <clears throat> I don't know where the photographs were going, but in the, it was all these Union Jack boxes with these shoes on. So it was a great point of sales. And that, you know, these things just helped, just helped build the brand, all these. And you know, the, the bits of luck, just things come out of uh, thinking. You know, nobody thought, if we put a Union Jack on, they're going to stack them in the windows. We mm. didn't know. It was just like, we're going to use the Union Jack because it's recognisable. See, when you're moving through the ranks and becoming a big brand, did any of the bigger brands ever try and buy you out, offer you a big deal? and say they, they could possibly take over us as a lump sum that kind of just buy them out? At that time, I don't think anybody was that big that they, they thought they needed to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we at $4 billion, we were bigger than Adidas and bigger than Nike. Mm -hmm. I mean, now Nike are in $25 billion, I think it is, and mm -hmm. Adidas are um, approaching $20 billion. <clears throat> So now, now oh, money's no. different. Mm -hmm. I mean, money doesn't seem to be much of a problem these days. There's always somebody there with tons yeah. of money to do this because it's just generating more. And the sports industry, I, I mean, we started off in 1958. And all the experience that I've had in the sports, we never went through a recession. Never. You know, and there must have been four or five recessions during that period. Mm -hmm. Sport has never gone through that because the, the more sort of life has grown, the more people want entertainment. And sport is the entertainment they're all going to in whatever way. And sport now influence, influences <clears throat> everything. Fashion, you name it. I mean, everything is now influenced by sport. People want more comfortable shoes, softer shoes. And they're all buying sports branded names or product that has been influenced by sport. So it never happened to us. We never went through a recession. Mm -hmm. Only covid has caused a sort of downturn because yeah. nobody got through COVID. How can people <laughs> then starting off a brand now compete with that? The likes of Reebok, Nike, Adidas, even that New Balance are still around. That will any is there any chance for anybody else? Do you think to then get to those heights? Because it's took you what over 10, 20 years to to kind of break into America. That is a long craft to push at to then be at the cream of the crop. But because of Everybody's so far ahead that like, it is difficult for other people to then set those targets. Well, you can never say never. That, of uh, course. You can never say never that there won't be anybody. I think Under Armour has probably been one of the latest ones in that are now quite successful. Jim Shark as well, Boy Ben, uh, I know but, Ben. Jim Shark is just going to start off into footwear. Mm -hmm. He's just starting that. But Jim Shark, yes, I mean, he's the, uh, a billion dollar brand. I mean, we were with Tom, Tommy Mallet yesterday and he's. Uh, approaching billion dollars, not mm. quite there yet. But Tommy Mallet is fashion, total fashion, influenced by sport. <clears throat> Whereas people like Under Armour or we're looking at Gymshark, they're mm. actually involved in performance, involved in sport. You know, their product is used in, in that way. <clears throat> so it, it's now got different areas where you can go and how you can get into it. Um, we have, uh, is it On, that Roger Federer now is uh, backing, he's yeah. backing On. And <clears throat> this combination now we're finding that more top sportsmen they paid so much money you know they can actually afford to get involved now in a brand mm -hmm. and so we're seeing that um and i and i think that yes those influences are now coming in the, the influences themselves you know shaquille o'neal who's part of abg you know he he has his own brand but he's now let's say part of abg which just bought reebok um Yes, I think we're going to get more 
opportunities, whether they have the enthusiasm to take it on, because they'll get to a point where it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we need more. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a point, you need more. There's something else has to happen for it to really get to the top yeah. and stay there. Because it's the hunger and the drive, like you see, you're 50, 60 years, still at it, still hustling, still doing your thing. Like You've got a good <laughs> life now, I see your photos and you're travelling, but it's the hunger to... Was there never a, a cut-off point for you to say, okay, I've got a billion, like I can sit back and relax, or is it a case of kicking on, trying to find that next Reebok pump, or trying to find the next aerobic shoe that's going to take it to another level? Like, was there ever a stop moment for you? Like, oh, I'm going to relax, or was that just yeah. keep going? No, no, there was a stop moment for me. Um, <clears throat> and it's when the challenge stopped, because you know when, when you get to four billion, you're a corporate company. And corporate is a totally different company from what I did. I mean, we started two people and, and we grew it. Lots of challenges, lots of things you had to get through. And by the time you become corporate, it's different. Lawyers look after everything. <laughs> it's just a matter of you know, facing the legal. <laughs> it's just a matter of <clears throat> this happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember that uh, we went down to... Um, it was in Trafalgar Square. There's the uh, the head, head office of the HMRC, the customs, whatever, revenue and customs. And uh, it was a time when they were thinking of taking the Reebok brand to America. It's still owned in, in the UK, believe it or not, still owned here in the UK. We were thinking of taking it to America. And uh, so they arranged this meeting with, um, with the revenue and customs. And... Uh, I remember going to that meeting. I still have the cards of the guys at the head there over the revenue and talking about, you know, can, can we take this uh, brand to America? And the guys revenue said, yeah, you could take it to America. Right. Okay. Well, because it's a revenue for, in the UK, uh, how much is it going to cost us? Because they, they, they would, revenue have to, would have to allow it to happen. And uh, the guys said, I don't know, really. Yeah, you, know, you just if you want to do it, you do it. And uh, also, um, what's it called? It's not uh, in, internal revenue. It's the American one. It's internal revenue. They were now raising questions that there was so much sales going on in the U, in the USA. How is it that these royalties are being paid to the UK? And uh, you know, we we need to sort of get a get a piece of it. The Americans wanted a piece of it. The American revenue wants a piece of it. And the, the guys are saying, well, if, uh, if you've got a problem with America, he said, we don't win many of those arguments with America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're so big. So, I mean, it, it had gone to that big. So, you know, we were talking about lawyers, we were talking about accountants, we were talking about things. You know, this has nothing to do with making the pump. Yeah. <laughs> and so when it gets to that, um, and we were four billion, and I, I'd put on thirty different countries around the world with with grown, and all I'm doing is I'm traveling now. Great, three times a year I'm going around the world. I'm going to the best. Uh, I'm picked up at the airport by a limousine. <clears throat> I'm going to the best hotels. We're having dining at the best places, and we're talking shoes and what's going on. But you know, the business itself now has moved to that different level. The business was, you know, we want to know what you're going to do next year, and you've got to put the. You know, Everybody's talking in different language. Time for me to go. Time for me to retire. Yeah. So, since there was no challenge, um, that was it. You know, it's like, what are you doing? You're just riding the machine, and it doesn't. You know, at that point, no, it didn't work. I mean, we had we had some great times because we're also doing the pro celebrity in Monte Carlo, and this way we got loads and loads of celebrities from. Hollywood, they used to come in, a lot of the tennis players used to come in, the top tennis players. Mm. And, I mean, those days were great, you know. We, I've got a list here of people, John Forsyth, Linda Evans, Joan Collins, Frank Sinatra, Conrad, Sean Conrad, Roger Moore, Jane Seymour, Chuck Norris, Robert Nero, uh, Michael Caine, you know, Charlton Heston, all these people you know, were there talking to them. And De Niro, what's De Niro like? Uh, you know, it's like thinking, well, you know, this, this is great. I mean, uh, you remember John Forsyth? Yeah. He was in dinner stay. Mm -hmm. And uh, only the second time I met him, we were in Monte Carlo, and he was a, he was a real trooper. He'd turn out any time for a Reebok. And we were at this massive dinner, and he came up to me and he said, Ah, Joe. Yeah. And I'm looking at John, and I'm saying, 
I know your name, that's it. And I said, John, you know, we've only met once before. Perhaps he, how can you remember my name? I do know it because I can't remember anybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, Joe, he said, you know, he said, that's my business. That's my job, remembering people, remembering their names. And you know, I was quite, I was amazed at that. But yeah, it was, it was a real good, uh, all these people were great to yeah. meet, you know. But uh, you realize, you know, I'm not an A-lister. I'm just a, you know, I'm, I'm a fraud here. <laughs> I make shoes, <laughs> nothing to do with this. We're just putting events on. So, but you make some of those events happen. Like you've worked with some of the biggest names, like the UFC, Reebok are still there, like Shaq O'Neal. Even yeah. some rappers, was, did I hear that like Jay-Z, 50 Cent have been involved yeah, yeah, in Reebok? Yeah. Was that yeah. another strategy? Yes. to then break yeah. into another market of like, do you come up with those strategies or is it now a team no. sitting at a round the, table? No, the, 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 the Americans come up with those strategies yeah. because it's in America and I, you know, I'm, I leave them to get, I left them to get on, you, know, you get on with you, whatever you're doing and I'll look after other things. So and the Americans are good at that. Yeah, they're good at networking yeah. and yeah. publicity. And yeah, they're really good at that, you know, and it's, it's like when you, you know, people say, oh, you did this, you did it. No, no. Probably the best thing I did was build a team, mm -hmm. <laughs> get the right people. And you can get the wrong people dead easy. Mm -hmm. You can get egos, and you don't want egos. You know, you want people who are going to become part of that team. The excitement of being part of Reebok, uh, the excitement of a winning culture. And we had that winning culture, so that people mm -hmm. felt they belonged to it. And, you know, that's what works. When you get egos, the people looking after themselves, they, mm -hmm. you know, they want their name there yeah. as against Reebok. For me, I, nobody knows who Joe Foster is. You know, he just happens to be a guy that, oh, we're learning. He wrote a book and oh, did he, you know, oh, he was a founder of Reebok, you know. But it was all about Reebok. So it was all about you, you, know, you push one name, you don't push mm -hmm. two or three. Did you ever try and go after names? Like, look, you look at Michael Jordan with the, the Air Jordans. Like, did you ever try and go for him before Nike went in? Could you imagine him with the Reebok pump? Do you think it potentially then could have been a twenty-five billion well, dollar company? Um, I think that. Do you ever uh, think about things like that, Joe? That. Well, I mean, yeah, you can think about whatever you want yeah, to think yeah. about. These things can be, you know, the, I'd retired well before um, you, you you worry about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we'd we become number one. We'd overtake Adidas, yeah. we'd overtake Nike. We'd become number one. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're saying, well, we're number one. You know, what did we do wrong? Not a lot. Um, and then you've got to think, yeah, you need younger people. You know, it's like uh, at my age, I have a challenge. What's my challenge? Shoemaker, the book. Mm -hmm. That's my challenge now. That's my, well, we're going to, yeah, let's get this to be a bestseller, my number one if we can. Let's make the influences that we can get out of selling the book. Reebok now is belongs to everybody. Reebok is big and uh, ABG, yes, they, uh, I think they bought it to use the name, uh, and Shaq, Shaq loves um, Reebok. Shaq I mean, Neil. yeah, Shaq and Neil, yeah, because yeah. you know that's you where he started. Him, Joe? No, never met him. But you know, I, I don't. I forget. I haven't met him. And he's seven foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a good man, charitable man as well, and does a lot of good in life. Like, yeah. I like his story. I listen to a lot. He's in conversations, and he's in a place where he likes to help people, and I like that. Like, yeah, I really do like that. It's admirable, admirable. Like, yeah, for people trying to give back and help that like, because he is a phenomenal super, he is a superstar and he's, he seems a, a really nice guy like, do you have any decision to make when they offer brands like the UFC and Reebok like as massive guys like Conor McGregor Khabib like yeah. wearing the Reebok brand like, global superstars do you have the decision as well back then to say right okay that's a good deal or did you just let no, the I, suits I, do it I think all this luck came from America mm hmm and my decision was to say, okay, we get into America, they know what to do. You know, they're, they're the guys who can do these deals. They, mm -hmm. they talk that language. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think that really, you, this is what you have to do. You have to, uh, you have to get to a point where you bring other people in. You know, it's like, I can, I can put whatever I had into the brand and I still have the enthusiasm for the brand. But you, know, you need people. You need people with ideas. You need people who can have different thoughts and than you can. And, you know, people, they ask me, what would the young Joe do today? And I said, well, he'd have to be young. You know, and, and Joe isn't young anymore. But, you know, so and I say, ask a young person what you would do today. Because it, 
it's so so changed. I mean, now we have so much technology, you know, so many things that we didn't. You know, I was a very simple technology, whatever we had. Now, uh, you just look at everything that's moving, and you know, we in <clears throat> various places we they all start talking about uh, NFTs. Uh, the metaverse. Yeah, um, we're, we're going. And this is where life is going into the mm. technology, and I don't understand the metaverse because it's. <laughs> I know about it. I hear about it. I can take in what they're saying, but you know, could I live in the metaverse? Well, you live forever in the metaverse, you know. And the people are saying, "Well, well you create your your other self in the metaverse, and he doesn't need to sleep. He can he can do whatever, you know." And yeah, so it's going in. <clears throat> There are different levels of understanding as to where, you know, whatever I understood. Julie, for me, she's our technician. Mm -hmm. I pick up my telephone and, uh, how do we do this? How do we do that? You know, younger brains. And, and now, <laughs> yeah, now now kids. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when, you know, when they brought out these uh, video recorders and they were so complicated. And the only people that could use them were kids. They're, they're the ones who could learn how to fiddle with all these things. Mm -hmm. It's the same now. You know, the kids can go through this. They can do whatever, whether it's, uh, you know, creating new ideas. I mean, NFTs, I think the, 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 there was only a young guy who made millions because he yeah. created an NFT. Yeah. So, you know, the the world is now, as, as always. It? It's, it's always a, evolving. Well, I don't know if it's evolving yeah. or devolving, but because I think human beings are becoming more disconnected. I think not too many people... A sociable anymore back in the day that like from when I grew up anyway everybody was out playing football they were yeah. getting dirty they were just being kids yeah now I don't see much of that in the streets and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing I don't know if human beings are becoming technologies should be connecting the world but it seems to be disconnecting it I don't know if it's used in the right way it could be a powerful tool social media but in your own opinion do you think you would have succeeded faster in today's age or were you happy back 50, 60 years ago doing what you were doing, hustling and traveling? Well, I mean, I went through the experience, so I'm happy to have gone yeah. through the experience. I think today is a, yeah, you can make it quicker and you could probably lose it quicker too, but uh, I think you can make it quicker today. I think you need to have the right personality because I think personalities rather than, um, rather than the name of brands, I think the personality comes out. It's like Tommy Mallet there, you know, he, mm -hmm. he's a great personality. And whatever he's doing is dependent upon his personality. Yeah. But to really grow a brand, and if the brand is going to be something, other people have to come in and, and help you get from your level. <clears throat> because whoever you are and however good you are, you, you've only got a certain level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes if, if your level is just making money, that's fine. But Tommy's making a brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's got to think of product. He's not just a man who works. Uh, we were in Dubai, and uh, this, this young guy, we said, he, he was the son of a famous dentist over there. I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, I trade cryptocurrencies. That's how he makes his living, trading cryptocurrencies. And they, Right, okay. <laughs> you know, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah we, we know a bit about it. Now. We're, we're learning, Julie's learning more than I'm learning, but hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're learning these changes. And you know, this is what's happening. It's... Um, Brands are becoming something else, and some you know, quite a few names are now brands. You know, it's uh, so it it is different, but that's right. This is the world. But like you, I do think uh, a lot of people are now they're almost scared to answer the door. Yeah, you know, that's, that's they spend sad, so yeah. much time looking mm -hmm. at the screens and and playing with it in order yeah. to do it. I mean, you know, to trade cryptocurrencies, you've got to be watch, you know, looking at your screens and mm -hmm. working on that. Your book, the for me. Yeah, your book, The Shoemaker, Joe, which we'll touch on. I'll leave the link in the description for people to get it. But how was that experience then, putting your story into a book for people to eventually... Joe Foster, the man behind Reebok. That. <laughs> yeah, well, now I'm selling Joe Foster now. instead of, mm -hmm. well, I'm selling Reebok as well, but Joe Foster. <clears throat> the reason for that is that after I retired, which was way, way back in 1990, just at the end of 1999, and uh, I thought, right, okay, it's corporate now. I mean, I'll go to Tenerife and we'll spend some time now relaxing. Well, spent some time, but of course, by this time, we now, we now get in... Um, um, computers and other things and I'm looking at Wikipedia and Google and Wikipedia's telling me how Reebok started. Well, you know, it used to be a company called J.W. Foster and they changed the name to uh, to Reebok. No, that didn't happen. That's not the story. <clears throat> and there were all sorts of 
stories, even a photograph of, this is Joseph William Foster, founder of Reebok. No, never seen him. Who was that? <clears throat> so uh, I thought, you know, a number of people said, why don't you write your story, Joe? I said, no, nobody's interested in my story. Um, I said, don't be surprised. So, okay. I thought, I better get this straight, you know, let's write it down and then people are not speculating and making and inventing how Reebok started. So I started writing the book. And, uh, and that was interesting because what is interesting is trying to get the chronology in order because you remember things and they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I had to work on this. I had to do a bit of sort of research to find out when did I do this? <laughs> when did this happen? And, and uh, also... Uh, <clears throat> I had to get some advice because I'm a shoemaker and I'm writing a book and I'm writing all these things. And this guy said, no, no, those are anecdotes. You know, you, you don't put anecdotes in because it, that's not the story. Uh, because you, you drift off into, you know, oh, I remember when I was in, um, in Hollywood and uh, I went to Ginger Rogers' house and, you know, and did this and all this. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, just mention you went there, but not all the stuff that goes with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, what I didn't expect is that everybody, a lot of people reading it said, God, there's so many lessons in here. Mm. Yeah, what you've done, it's amazing. Even Tommy Mallett today was saying, you know, when I read your book, wow, yeah, I should try to do that. I should do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I should stop doing that. <laughs> mm. and, and, and I think what has become now, because we, we've done London Business School, we've done uh, University College London, UCL, um, and it's all their MBE MBA students, they, they sort of, you know, they're in there and they're telling them, you know, what to do. Mainly they're telling them, you know, uh, what's your exit plan? <laughs> you know, and they asked me, what was your exit plan, Joe? Didn't have one. Oh, we don't teach that. Yeah, oh, I didn't have an exit plan. We had, we had, we had a mission. Mm -hmm. Mission wasn't an exit plan. Now it's all to do with how you create money, how you create a business and how you get out of that business. And uh, so... I think what was interesting for these students is that they're learning, you know, you don't need an exit plan. <laughs> you need to enjoy life. Because yeah. if all you're doing is to, is to wait for that day when you're going to get out, are you going to get there and enjoy it? Okay, a lot of people just go through that business and earn the money and, and get out. But for me, it was more of a vacation. You know, this is what you do. We're enjoying mm -hmm. Reebok. For any entrepreneurs watching, Joe, that, what's the main advice you would give for them? Maybe just starting off or going through the journey to try and succeed. Like, what's the best advice you have for them? There's only one piece of advice. Have fun. Mm -hmm. That's the best advice for all life, mate, <laughs> is just to try and enjoy it. But sometimes yeah. obsession kicks in, a bit of greediness as well. That It's crazy. Also, before we finish up, the Reebok Stadium, Bolton, is that because of your connection with Bolton? What's the story behind that? It, it was, yes. It mm -hmm. was because... Um, uh, Reebok, well, no, Bolton ones were moving from a downtown sort of site to a new one. And um, since we were Bolton-based and whatever, uh, we did get involved and we took the naming rights. <clears throat> so that was okay. It was okay when... I mean, the thing is, it was, it's, it's now called... It's, it's really called Middlebrook, which is a, a, a retail site, a big retail mall and site and everything. Uh, and, and the Reebok uh, Stadium was part of it. And uh, although Reebok have moved on now, it's now the University of Bolton Stadium. Mm -hmm. My mouthful, but that's what it is. But everybody, you talk to anybody, and uh, I'll see you at the Reebok. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they go, they actually go into the, uh, the Middlebrook place. Yeah. yeah. So I'll see you at the Reebok. But it's just so easy. You know, Reebok, it, mm -hmm. it is an easy word, which is one of the things when we, Mercury, we like the name Mercury. But, you know, you've got three syllables there was Reebok too, and it's immediately <clears throat> dead easy. So, uh, it was a good name. Mm -hmm. Last question, brother. See, when you, before your dad passed, did he get to see you spread your wings and achieve everything that you set out to do? Well, he didn't, he didn't get to see everything, but he did see us succeeding and uh, spreading our wings. <clears throat> the most uh, the saddest thing was my brother, because I just managed to get into America. We just got the company and got Paul Feynman, got our five-star shoe, and unfortunately, he died. He got cancer and he died. And yeah, he was the athlete, but he pushed himself. He wasn't a 
brilliant athlete. Um, but, you know, if you're running with about um, 500, 600 other runners, there's 10 who are usually about the same level that you are. Mm -hmm. And you've got to beat all of them. You know, it's, it's like, and, it, and he was physically sick at the end of every race because he pushed himself too hard, whether he was cycling, whether he was running. And it, he got stomach cancer. And I'm sure it was because Sorry, of that. that. And, uh, and he died in 1980, just as we would got into America. So he didn't see the success. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I guess what it did, it's probably spurred me on to make sure that, you know, we're going to do it. Yeah. We're actually going to succeed here. Uh, we're going to be a company. You know, we're going to, I don't think you dream you're going to be number one. I think that's, that, that's something that happens, but I think you, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want to be a success. Yeah. But you clearly are Joe and everything you achieved, you're clearly a fighter. You never quit. You created one of the, the, the biggest sports brand on the planet. Like, it's an unbelievable story for people watching. They'll get tools and techniques to understand that quitting's not an option. Exit plans aren't an option. If you want to succeed, it's only you that can fail. Like, for coming on today, Joe, I thoroughly right. enjoyed your story. Thank you, Your James. book as well. I'll leave your link in the description. But again, you're an amazing man and people get a lot of inspiration from your story. And, and God bless you for the future. And keep enjoying life and keep smiling. And same to you, James. Thank Enjoy you. life because Cheers. that's what it's all about. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Bye.